Well, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. And better is one day in His courts. That's really good to be here this morning. Um, there's so much. I woke up this morning and I thought, boy, there's so much I'd like to say about what's going on and everything else. And I thought, no, today's Shabbat. Today's Shabbat. But I will say this. Let's remember to pray for the people of Ukraine. And there are a lot of people in Russia who are against it. And there are Messianic communities in Ukraine. Rabbi Shapira took a Torah scroll to Ukraine some years back. So there are Jewish people there. There are Messianic people there. So we want to keep them in prayer. Let's go ahead and make our great declaration. Hafokba, hafokba, the kolaba. Hafokba, hafokba, mashiachba. Turn it and turn it for everything is in it. Turn it and turn it for Messiah is in it. He is. He told the Pharisees, Moses wrote about me. And the next one, for every good and acceptable sacrifice, there is a divine response. So parshat vayachel, and he assembled. So Moses has come down off of Sinai after God has given him instruction, and he's called everybody together, and he's going to relate to them what God had related to him. How many of you read Parshat Vayachel this week? Did you notice anything a little unusual about it? A little unusual. We'll get into that. So I'll start with Hosea 14, 7. Again, they will live in his shade and raise again. I'm sorry, raise grain. They will blossom like a vine, and its aroma will be like the wine of Lebanon. So there is this week talking about the aroma. We'll talk about the aroma of Messiah and several other things. Now, Vayakel is usually read together with Parshat Picoday. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the Torah is divided into 54 weekly sections. 54. Only 52 weeks. Yeah, it's to make up for the leap year. And of course, this is a leap year on the Hebrew calendar. And so, because of that, we're reading Vayakel separately from Picoday. And these are the last two portions of the book of Exodus before we get to enter in. Yes, Leviticus, my favorite. Uh, so, if as you read it, you see that this is... These last two portions are about the instructions that Moses gives the people of Israel and the completion of the Mishkan, the, the fruition of everything that God had told them, this is what you're going to do. And you remember the, the whole point of building the Mishkan is bring what happened on top of Sinai to bring the presence of God and the glory of God down to where the people are. Um, it's about the consecration, the priesthood, and several other things. What was the very first instruction that he gave in building the tabernacle? Yeah. Don't. As, as important as it was, we're going to build a structure to bring the glory of God down from Sinai down in the midst of us. And his first instruction, don't work on the Sabbath. And don't you know they had to be thinking, okay, that's cool, but what's, you know, work was not defined. So it's like, how do we know what work is and what's not? And eventually they figured out everything it takes to build the tabernacle, all those 39 things that it took, the actions it took, that's work. And so we don't do it on Shabbat. Uh, and I was going to talk about that, but not to this day. Don't kindle a fire on Shabbat. Don't kindle a fire on Shabbat. And I wanted to talk about that because I, I'm going to confess something here to you. In the past, and I'm working really hard on it now, sometimes the fire of my temper would flare up on Shabbat. I can't do that. I've got to not do that. So the Lord is working on me. So he's telling them, everybody, all right, this is what you're going to do. Bring gifts for the tabernacle, and we're going to set Bezalel and Aholiab apart, and others who were given wisdom to know how to do the various works and the various things that were going to be involved in the making of the tabernacle. So we get a repeat of previous instructions. So if you read Vayachel this week, it's like, we just read this in Teramah, 
and in tetz are they. We've already read all of this, and that's true. But there are some differences here, and we're going to talk about these differences because you would think that it would have been Moses came down, told them everything, and that it would just record, and they did what Moses told them to do. But there are some differences, and these differences are very instructive about some things that are going on. And there's a detail that I just love in here, and it's hard, it's easy to miss. Exodus 36, 8 through 10. All the wise-hearted among those doing the work made the Mishkan. Mishkan is tabernacle. Ten curtains of linen twisted were turquoise, purple, and scarlet wool. He made them with the woven design of Caravim. What's odd here? Yeah, how does he know what the Kerevim looked like? Actually, God had shown Moses, but all of the wise-hearted among them, he made them. It went from plural to singular. So what's it, was it suddenly they just all bowed out and said, hey, we're not going to do this up to Bitzalel. What it is, this is the same thing that happened when they got to Mount Sinai. It said they camped plural, and then suddenly in Hebrew, it went from they camped to he camped. They were so united, so much bonded together, it was as though they were one person. And so as Jay was reading this morning, he made this, he did this. It wasn't one person. It was everybody working together in perfect unity. Can you imagine what would happen in our nation today if everybody who believed in Yeshua, whether we call him Yeshua or Jesus, if we put aside things that kept us from walking together in total unity, doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. Can you imagine what would happen to our nation? What would happen in Israel if they truly walked together in the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace? Messiah would come. He would come back. So uh, it was in this unity that they were to build the Mishkan. It was in that unity that they were able to receive the Torah in the first place. And God had told them, make sure, God had told Moses, make sure that you tell them to do it according to the model that I have shown you in heaven. Um, and so detail by detail. The big difference in these same details this week is that, well, let me read off my thing. I, I told Darlene after I left last week, I said, something's not right. And I got to think about it. I thought, oh, gosh, I left something extremely important out of the message to tie it all together. So I'm going to stick close to my notes so I don't wander away. Okay. The order is different this week than last week's portion and before. And it gets back to this. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, what is set in place there is you have two different perspectives. You have the perspective of heaven, and you also have the perspective of earth. So when God is given details on how to build a Mishkan, it's God's instructions first from God's perspective. I'll give you an example. And here's the order that it follows because God started on the inside and he moved toward the outside. And, and by the way, what did Yeshua emphasize to everybody? Was it the ceremonial stuff? It was the heart. Same thing. So from heaven's perspective, this is the order. God told Moses, the ark first and then the vessels, and then the tent, and then the priesthood. Oh, yeah, and the incense altar. But the incense altar is inside the holy place, just before the uh, tent, before the Holy of Holies. It's kind of like, is this an afterthought here? So we find out in Parshat Vayakel, it's a very very different order. So, in the last two portions, the outer part is built first from the human perspective. They build the outer part first, they erect it, and then they put all of the vessels inside of it. And in this time, the altar of incense is in its place. So why would the altar of incense seem like an afterthought from God's perspective, but for 
the perspective of Moses and the people of Israel, it have, would have to take its rightful place. And that's, I think it's all about God reaching out to us and us reaching back out to God. Uh, incidentally, and I love this part that you read also, you notice about the lava where the priests were to wash their hands and their feet. Remember what it was made from? From the women's mirrors. They gave up their mirrors. Now, you remember when it came to the golden calf in the Hebrew, it's pretty much, it's clear in the Hebrew, they had to forcefully take the gold from the women because the women knew this is not right. But in this case, for the purpose of ministering, for the purpose of the priesthood and for the purpose of all of Israel and the redemption of the world, the women gladly gave up what they had. It's like I've said before, the ladies are much more spiritually attuned than the men are. That's, that's why men have to do more commandments than women. It's not that women can't do them. It's that the men have to because we need reminders. The ladies, not so much. So the incense altar is put in its place, and then past that comes the bronze altar and for sacrifice. And I want to talk a little bit about that later. So I want to talk first about the functions of the altar. The incense altar was used twice daily. Twice daily. I bet somebody can tell me what it was done with. Yeah, the Tamid offerings, the one early in the morning and the one late in the evening. Every time that the Tamid offering was made, uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, before anybody could come and make a sacrifice, before anybody could come and bring an offering, the priesthood first had to sacrifice a lamb in the mornings and burn it up on the altar. And so that was called the Tamid, one in the morning and one in the evening. And all the sacrifices took place between those. Without that having taken place, nobody could offer a sacrifice. Can I chase a rabbit real quick? You're going to have to keep an eye on me. How about where people say, without blood being shed, there is no forgiveness of sin. But wait a minute. People brought grain offerings, and that's the holiest of all offerings. And what about the day that Yeshua was crucified? Hmm. Well, did you know the Tamid offering was offered under those circumstances also? So it, it holds its place. And that's a long discussion. I'm not going to get into that. So the incense offering was offered twice daily. But on Yom Kippur, it was a special thing. Because on Yom Kippur, the high priest would go in. He would take coals from the altar of the incense. And he would take that beyond the curtain into the Holy of Holies, Kadosh Kadoshim. He would take in with him incense, and there he would put the coals down and would put the uh, incense on it, and there would be this cloud that would come up. Okay, very special. So when that cloud of his came up, what appeared? Somebody? The Shekinah, the glory of God, appeared inside the Holy of Holies when he offered up that incense. So it's kind of like the Shekinah, the glory, was brought down from Sinai, would reside there inside the Holy of Holies. And as the high priest on behalf of the people of Israel would put incense on the censer with coals from the incense altar, as the smoke of the, for the people rose up, it would meet with the glory of God. And the smoke and the glory would combine together. And we're talking about something that is a picture of what's going to happen when the kingdom of God is established, and it's going to be worldwide. Okay, so they would merge as one, and God's presence would come into camp only if he was invited by the people. God doesn't force himself on anybody. So the high priest came from the people, they made his clothing, they consecrated the high priest, they consecrated all the vessels and everything else. And so Israel's response to God prompted God to come and to share his glory with them and dwell in them so that they might be redeemed. So God instructed Moses from his perspective, the heart of the Mishkan, the very heart of the tabernacle to the outside. And the construction was from Israel's perspective. 
taken everything from the outside to the heart, to the middle of it. So it looks like we're back to the perspective of heaven and earth. In other words, heaven was reaching down to earth and earth was reaching up to heaven. And it was because of a sacrifice and because of a sweet aroma. So the incense altar is all about Israel's approach to God and the redemption of the world. In other words, God was not going to be out of reach. But we just have to do things His way. This was Israel's response to God. But first, something had to take place. The offering incense, uh, the incense offering was never done alone. It was always done with a Tamid offering and on Yom Kippur. And that required a bronze offer, altar for sacrifice. I want to show you a picture. So, this is inside what is called the Haikal or the holy place. And you see the curtain back there. On the other side of that curtain is the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Testimony. So as the priest would come in, the first thing he would do would approach the altar of incense. And the fire would be on it. And then he would put the uh, incense on it. And you notice as he went past that, you've got the uh, menorah on the left. And on the right... You've got the table. I don't know why it's called showbread. How did it ever get translated as showbread? It's like, it just doesn't. It's called, literally, the bread of the face of the presence of God. So as he approaches the menorah, which is the light, and I'm thinking about where Yeshua said, I am the light of the world, and the table for the bread and Yeshua saying I am the bread of life and right there behind the curtain was the Holy of Holies. Could not approach without that sweet aroma being produced that would invite the presence of God. Okay? I'm going somewhere with all this. I want to show you something. Uh, is it Exodus 38, 1 and 2. He made the altar for burnt offerings of acacia wood, seven and a half feet long and seven and a half feet wide. It was square. It was four and a half feet high. He made its horns for it on its four corners. The horns were of one piece with it, and he overlaid it with bronze. So this is kind of curious. The altar for offering the sacrifices was made of bronze. So if you compare bronze to gold... On the outside was the bronze, and you go to in, on the inside is gold. If you compare the two, well, what do we know about bronze? It was used as weapons. It has a lower melting point. It's not as enduring as gold is. As a matter of fact, you can take gold and you can throw it in the ocean. If somebody come along thousands of years later and dig it up, and guess what? It's still good. You throw bronze in the ocean, salt's going to eat it up. Why is it that the altar where you bring the sacrifices was lesser than the altar, the, the altar for the incense? Because the altar for the sacrifices was on the outside. And I'm thinking about where, where Rav Shaul said that our lives are to be living sacrifices. We have to give up our desires, our wants, everything else we want, in order to begin to approach God. And, ha and, and it's by faith in Yeshua that we do so. And, yeah, yeah I'm going to go ahead and say it. Every offering was made on that altar, except for one. Does anybody know what it was? It was the red heifer. That's another very long teaching, and I wish I had time to get into it, and I don't. So the sacrifices were an act of worship. You ask a lot of people, what were the sacrifices for? And most people think that every sacrifice was for sin. However, we know by reading Scripture that the vast majority of sacrifices served one purpose, and that is an act of worship. And you remember, Yeshua said, if your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. He's saying God's not going to accept worship if you got something against your brother. So make it right with your brother and then go and offer your gift to God. It's all about worship. Um, 
So some were for sin, which was activated by Adam in the Garden of Eden. And the Hebrew word for bronze, I think I have this up here, do I? I do. I do. The Hebrew word for bronze is nechoshet. Nechoshet. And the word nechosh, well, this is strange. Nechosh is serpent. And you take these animals as a substitution when it's a sin offering because it was your sin, but God is allowing a substitution. Because there are times when we sin, whose way are we following? Well, following after the desires of our own flesh. And that was done because Adam said, hey, we'll do things your way. And the reverse of that is to put our desires and our will and everything else upon the bronze altar to say, I'm going to be a living sacrifice unto you. So during the temple years, by the way, I want to say one other thing quickly about it. When Israel sinned with idolatry, you remember a plague broke out among the people? In other words, the Nachash rose up. You remember what Aaron did? He took a censer. Moses told him, quick, take coals in your censer and take incense and stand between the people. And he stood between the living and the dead. And what happened? Plague stopped. Well, there's something odd about that. What did God command Aaron that he must never be near and could never be near dead people. He violated his office, and yet God said, I'm going to overlook it because he did so for uh, the sake of the people. <coughs> so during the temple years, the temple got set up, but it didn't take long before idolatry set in. And when idolatry set in and God sent prophets and said, you got to stop doing this, they kept it up, and finally God said, okay, Babylon's going to come in, and they ended up taking 90% of the people away, and they took them to Babylon in the temple. <coughs> oh, excuse me. The temple was destroyed. Seventy years later, they got back in the land, rebuilt the temple, but there was something missing. Anybody know what was missing? The Ark of the Covenant was missing. No Ark of the Covenant, no Yom Kippur. No Yom Kippur, no glory. No glory, no atonement, no forgiveness. The people of Israel were in trouble. They were in terrible trouble. The Romans came in after the temple was destroyed a second time. I'm sorry, before the temple was destroyed a second time. And while it seemed like the glory of God was not there, that's when Yeshua arrived on the scene. And that's when Yeshua, just like we talked a few weeks ago about God hiding in, in the darkness of the cloud, here was God in human form hiding who he was from everybody except for a very few people. And so he was sent for the redemption, tempted by Satan in the wilderness, went through his own fire, uh, and it prepared him for the time that he would be the Passover, the sin offering for everybody. And with that, there would be a sweet aroma. So I want to take a look at John 12, verse 3. This is just before Passover, when Yeshua would be crucified. Miriam took a whole pint of pure oil for spikenard, which is very expensive, poured it on Yeshua's feet and wiped his hair with his feet with her hair so that the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. So it's kind of like the same thing when, when the uh, worshiper, when the fragrant uh, incense was put on the golden altar, when the worshiper would come and bring his offering, he could smell that sweet smell coming from the uh, holy place. And so here's Yeshua, the Lamb of God, now in Miriam, who is pouring out the spikenard on him. Now, we know the spikenard 
was used to prepare somebody for burial. Usually that was done after the person had died. This was a clear message. Yeshua was about to die on Passover. And Miriam is pouring it out on him. Again, it goes back to Eden. You remember after Eve had said, the serpent deceived me and I ate? Of course, that was also when Adam said, it's her fault. God told the serpent, I will put enmity between her seed and between your seed. Now, her seed, that's the only time that the Bible mentions the seed of a woman. So obviously it's talking about Yeshua being born from Miriam, who was an unmarried woman and had not been defiled. Defiled is not a good word for that anyway. I'm trying to be careful because there are little ones here. But the seed of, of Satan, the seed of Satan, who is the seed of Satan? And we go back to what Kaylee read today. You've got all of these religious authorities who are all about themselves and their hearts are far from God. The religious leaders are the ones that Yeshua called the sons of Satan because they refused to do what Abraham did. You remember he said, if you would do the works of Abraham, but you don't, it's like in Isaiah said, you serve me with your lips, but your hearts are very far from me. And he told them that. So they were living a life that was not a faith, but relying, Abraham's our father. Hey, we don't have to do anything. We're kind of like, it's kind of like we're God's grandchildren. Anybody ever heard that expression before, God's grandchildren? I've known a lot of people. You ask them about their faith. Well, I grew up in church. My, my parents this and my grandparents that, but they don't talk about themselves. We've got Abraham, so we're good. Oh, don't say it. Yes, I'm going to say it. There's a very famous preacher in Texas, in Central Texas, and I'm not going to mention San Antonio, uh, uh, a city in Central Texas. And he says, Darlene and I know a young Jewish girl. Well, she's not so young anymore. She became a believer in Messiah Yeshua. And her family got quite upset. So they called this guy in San Antonio who loves Israel and supports Israel. But he's got something wrong. He called her up for them and said, sweetheart, you don't need to believe in Jesus. You're Jewish. You don't need him. You know what she told him? Don't ever call me again. Why should we proclaim Yeshua? Because he's Messiah. That's what Israel is looking for. Okay, I'll get back on track here. So the, the Torah teachers he was talking about here, they were rejecting the Torah. And the proof came later with the destruction of the temple. Well, so Yeshua was crucified. And as it said in Genesis, that the serpent bruised his heel, but he crushed the serpent's head. Talking about, I talk about Hasatan when he said, All authority is now mine. I got all the authority. But when he was taken and he was beat and he was crucified, because Miriam had just right before that, not long before that, had covered him with spikenard, a sweet incense was on him. A sweet smell was on him as he was taken to the cross. Just like when the priest would go in and would put incense on the golden altar and then the sacrifices would be brought. And what else is really nice about that, I think about, is the same aroma that was on him was also on her. So he, the Mishkan.